All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back uh, to Azapo's uh, online political education series. And uh, today I'm playing host to two stalwarts of our Black Consciousness Movement, uh, Comrade uh, Matata Tsedu, a, a veteran of our liberation struggle. I also have uh, Ndate Mangena um, on the line. So today we will uh, be talking about the experiences of um, Solitary confinement as uh, a lockdown, as well as lockdown. Comrade Matata Tsedu is um, a veteran of our struggle, and uh, he has uh, spent many months on solitary confinement, and uh, along with um, a, a lot of a uh, number of uh, our stalwarts of struggle, and Dademangi and I also spent some time in uh, solitary confinement, and uh, in the last uh, six months or so, we have been exposed to some form of uh, confinement uh, through the coronavirus lockdown. And uh, today we are spending time with these two stalwarts of our movement just to tease them a bit, tease them a bit about their own experiences and how, you know, do they see uh, what is happening now during this lockdown and how does it compare to the confinement that they experienced uh, during the period of liberation struggle. Uh, welcome and that uh, Matata Tsedu and uh, welcome that uh, Mangena. So um, first we will be engaging with uh, that uh, Tsedu and uh, talking about um, what um, he felt, what we, he saw and how he experienced uh, solitary confinement during his incarceration, um, you know, during his days of um, liberation struggle. And he has uh, written quite a lot about uh, this experience as a veteran journalist and um, that um, uh, Mangena will then talk to us about, uh, you know, the present circumstances in terms of how do they compare to what he experienced uh, during, uh, you know, those days of solitary confinement. Welcome, Towers. Um, okay. We have just uh, lost a connection there to... Comrade Seydoux, let's um, quickly sort out our tech issues and then we should be good to go. Yeah. Uh, okay, you're back. Yeah. All right, now, thank you. And as I indicated, I am here with uh, Comrade Matata Tsedu, a veteran journalist and a stalwart of the Black Consciousness Movement. And uh, he is here to talk to us about his experience of um, you know, the times um, of solitary confinement during the period of our liberation struggle. And um, uh, later on, I will be engaging with uh, that uh, Musibudi Mangena, who will be talking to us about uh, the comparisons that he sees uh, when he, he looks at what is happening now with the last uh, you know, six months or so of uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown and how does it compare to what they experienced during the time of liberation struggle as they both experienced uh, solitary confinement in those uh, apartheid cells. Uh, welcome, Comrade Matata Tsedu. Thank you. Um, you know, the first session will be with uh, Comrade Matata Seydu, so I will just uh, give him, um, you know, some time just to share his perspective and uh, experiences with us, and then later on we'll engage with uh, Ndate Mangen. Um, Comrade Matata, the floor is yours. No, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, solitary confinement by definition means you are alone, not by choice, but through confinement or someone else's decision. In that condition of confinement, you are lonely. When you are alone by your own volition, it is called solitude. Wikipedia makes the following distinction between these two conditions, and I quote, there's a big difference between solitude and loneliness. Loneliness is a negative force marked by a sense of isolation. One feels that something is missing. Solitude is the state of being 
alone without being lonely. It is a positive and constructive state of engagement with oneself, close quote. So when we speak about solitary confinement, we are talking about a negative force. And here in our country, we would be talking about a period of heightened oppression and suppression when mainly black people were detained and tortured, either to extract a self-incriminating statement to be used for prosecution of yourself or your comrades, or to be simply taken away and locked for months on end without the system, uh, <clears throat> because the system found you a nuisance outside jail. Section six of the Suppression of Communism Act and later various sections of the Internal Security Act were used to keep detainees in jail for long periods without the need to be charged or even to be seen by a lawyer. You are deprived of information. Sometimes you would be banned and prohibited from leaving firstly the, mag the magisterial district totally. Uh, without a permit. And secondly, then the premises you are restricted to, you would not be allowed to live between certain hours over weekends and public holidays. And at the same time, you would be barred from receiving visitors at those premises. So if you were single, like Comrade Mangena was in the beginning, that meant for those parents, you were in solitary confinement, even if you were not in jail proper. In my case, when I was banned, my wife and kids were further north from where I was, where she was working. So effectively, evenings from seven, all weekends and public holidays were solitary jail time. The key to for me, whether in jail or under burning intent of the Boers was, which was wow. understanding that was the first step towards uh, <clears throat> because whether it was detention or a burning order, your life changed. You could no longer do things you used to do. I was just about 30 years old and in the prime of my life and for the first time I was enjoying my work. I went to meetings of my union, Mwasa. I attended political gatherings, whether to report or to participate or both. I traveled around the region and around the country a lot covering political court cases or uncovering farm atrocities against black workers. And in one swell soup, all that came to a screeching halt one day. I could no longer leave Sisheho. It rattles your system and uh, <clears throat> you need to be strong and understand the rules of the game if you are to survive. And that rule is you must survive by being strong. Strength comes from a mind that is not idle, but a mind at work. So one had to find things to do. We had an informal training club in for example, with Tabo Muntane, Pet Kobela, Brasol Rapararani. And at around five each morning uh, during the week, we would hit the road and get to the Blood River Bridge and do our stretch training there. The day for me, had started positively every weekday. You had lots of time on your hands, so you have to find things to do. I read a lot. I also spent a lot of time at a scrapyard owned by a man we knew as uh, <clears throat> Smogo in Sushiro. It was just opposite the uh, Sushiro hostel. I became an expert on repairing the VW Beetle and owned quite a few that I bought at government auctions, auctions that were in terms of the law, I was not even supposed to attend, but I would defy and go. 
And later on, we created a, a sub office of the Northern Transvaal Advice Office in Sishiru, where I worked with Ru and dealt with labor and other issues. Our primary aim for anyone we assisted was to show them how they were where they were because they were not members of a trade union. Virtually all the people we assisted joined unions afterwards. We had one room at the Podisha di Chava Lutheran Center provided by Reverend Cherry. And <clears throat> to create an illusion of two offices, we subdivided it with flimsy wood partition that did not even reach the ceiling. We created a door uh, between my office and Tavo's office that was closed with a curtain. Technically, Tavo was in another office and I was in another. And that way we could service our clients. Without that partition, we could not have worked as I could not <clears throat> be with more than one person at a time. The police raided us frequently, but technically we were in two offices. We were fighting back against the psychological onslaught against us. In order to, to deal with this uh, uh, um, psychological warfare, I took my three, then three-year-old daughter, Moabe, from her mother, and she lived with me full time. During the day, I dropped her at a crutch. So overnight, this little girl developed many grown-up friends who came to visit her at home. They were her guests and not mine. There was no law that said older people couldn't be friends with a three-year-old. You had to beat the system at its own game. When I was detained in Morningside police cells with a number of PAC and applicators in 1982 and tortured horribly in Krugersdorf, to beat the system, we created a communication system that used the toilet for what we, we, we would today uh, call end-to-end -end encrypted messages. When we were transferred to Krunpend prison in the Free State, we used the sewerage system of the prison to send letters home with prisoners manning the sewer plant warned to look out for plastics with our letters, which they would organize envelopes and stamps with those who were prisoners who were going outside to work. The people at home, we felt, just needed a even if there was no return address. When I was moved to Fandabel Park Police Service, I organized a pen and a jigsaw puzzle of about 2,500 pieces, which I spent a lot of time uh, uh, working on. The picture of this jigsaw puzzle included clouds at the top. And everyone or anyone who has uh, done real jigsaw not the 10 and 15 and 20 pieces, but the real thing, will tell you clouds are a menace because th that, that area just looks the same. But it meant I spent a lot of time occupied. I organized the pen and used the box of the jigsaw to do some mathematics work on my family's names. For example, that meant creating a universal set with all our names. Mine, my wife, my son, Mpo, my daughter, Mo, and then the subsets and how each of these names intersected with all others in the letters of the names. And then I worked out stuff like how many letters we all shared, how many I shared with my wife, how many I shared with my son, how many with my daughter, and what were the letters that were not shared by anyone at all. It sounds like a lot of nonsense, uh, <clears throat> but it kept me going. When I was released, I kept that piece of paper and recently I was trying to locate it, but couldn't. It felt like I had lost a big part of my experience. In Zibidiela police service, 
during the state of emergency in 1986. I sang every night freedom songs, from freedom songs to Dobby Gray's loving arms. I can do it even now. Uh, <clears throat> and to sign off each night, I would sing, sing your la la nying edwa etuneni la. The key thing was to develop a routine that kept the mind busy. For example, in Fandabeo, I would run around the cell yard for an hour every day. And because I lived in that cell for six full months, by the time I left, there was a well-worn out path of my route. I was not going, I had decided that I was not going to be broken. I knew I had to survive, and that meant turning the negative loneliness uh, of confinement into some form of positive solitude. When the lockdown stage five came, I opted to lock down at our farm outside Makadi. I found myself going back to some of the routines, like walking about two kilometers each morning on the farm. But I had chosen the farm because it is a functional place. Uh, and uh, as such, the restrictions were not for us that severe, uh, as we had many hectares to walk around and work. I suspect if I had locked down in Jobek, I would have reactivated all my survival techniques because of the space. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, thanks, uh, Comrade uh, Matata. That was, uh, you know, some, some experience indeed. Uh, it is not something uh, that uh, people would be able to survive easily. And uh, it would be interesting to hear what uh, Dr. Mangena has to say about, uh, you know, that which you, you just uh, narrated compared to what we are seeing today. And I'm sure all of those came in very handy, you know, those techniques and tactics uh, came in very handy to survive uh, in this lockdown. And the beauty about the previous lockdown was that it was something that was uh, forced upon you and you took the decision to resist it. And now uh, this, this time the lockdown is something that we all need for us to be able to survive. And Dariamangen, what do you have to tell us? Oh, well, a, a lot of it uh, dovetails with what uh, Matata has just shared with us. Um, with me, it starts with uh, a detention uh, at a Walmart police station in, uh, in uh, the Eastern Cape uh, under Section 6 of the Terrorism Act. And uh, that, that's really, it, it tortures your body more than, uh, I mean, your mind more than it tortures your body. And you feel as if it would be better if uh, the, the Boers would come and talk to you, interrogate you, uh, or beat you up or something. Because uh, being alone in a single cell, um, sometimes you feel as if you could go mad. And uh, I used to, to, to sing, as Matata was saying, uh, and dance, you know, the popular tunes of the time, dance alone. And I'll listen to, uh, common law prisoners in neighboring um, cells, singing and beating one another up uh, uh, and so on, because that's, that's what they did most of the time. And at some point, uh, I had a, a black policeman because it was only the white guys who were the white policemen who used to come into that cell where I was detained alone for uh, about three months. Uh, I asked him for uh, uh, something to read. Uh, he he in, resisted for a while. And then one day he brought me a magazine called uh, Living and Loving. Um, <laughs> it was about something like uh, probably three to six months old. Uh, but to me, it was quite a companion, you know? Um, it talks mainly about beauty, about women's underwear, about uh, 
rearing children, how to look after children, babies, and, and things like that. I read it from cover to cover, many times over. This policeman had asked me that once I'm done with it, I should destroy it and flush it down the toilet, but I couldn't. I kept it under uh, the blankets, the dirty blankets that I used to sleep on for quite a number of days until I thought maybe I will bring him into uh, some trouble and, and then uh, I destroyed it. But it is that kind of thing that, you know, um, anything that can keep your mind uh, going uh, would be very useful. Then of course, um, uh, solitary confinement ended when I was uh, eventually sentenced to five years uh, in prison on Robben Island. Um, and, but the entire journey from uh, Grahamstown to Port Elizabeth prison for a number uh, where I spent a few days, uh, to Pretoria where I was uh, uh, again kept in solitary confinement, uh, and then to Lokop, where prison where I then met some other freedom fighters from the ANC, Cholo and others, and we were in the same cell. Uh, and then of course transported to Robben Island where then you know you could meet with the other uh, prisoners and uh, discuss lots of stuff and uh, uh, debate political issues and so on. But then when I was uh, about to be released in 1978, say uh, six weeks or so, uh, I was removed from uh, Robben Island prison to Polsmoor prison, together with other political prisoners who were just about to be released. But at Polsmoor prison, we were uh, put in single cells, solitary confinement, um, where we spent a few days. Then they moved us to uh, Port Elizabeth prison, where we were again put in single cells and we spent uh, a number of days there. Even though uh, the other political prisoners uh, who were with me uh, were put in more or less the same areas and when we had exercise, we would do that together. But we were kept away from common law prisoners uh, who were you know, prohibited meeting with us or, uh, uh, see, or even seeing us. Uh, and then a few days uh, at uh, Port Elizabeth prison, we were taken to uh, East London prison. I think it's, it's called uh, uh, Fort, Fort Lamorgan or something. Uh, and as we go, those who were supposed to be released in uh, a PE were released there. And those who were supposed to be released in uh, East London, they were released there. And then they uh, moved us to Bloemfontein prison. And once again, uh, solitary confinement for a few days. And then they moved me to uh, Pretoria prison. Uh, by the time they moved me there, I was alone. Uh, again, in, sol in solitary confinement for a few days. Then they moved me to Leokop prison. And because I was on my way out, I was again put in a single cell um, in solitary confinement. Then a few days before I was supposed to be removed, uh, to, I mean to be released, they uh, drove me to Polokwane prison. It was Petersburg uh, prison then, where I was uh, uh, again detained in solitary confinement. Uh, and on the day on which I was supposed to be released from my understanding, uh, this was the 3rd of October, uh, 1978. Uh, I, my understanding was that I would be re re released uh, in the morning, but I wasn't. And uh, by about uh, four o'clock or so in the afternoon, I was toy doing, you know. Uh, I was telling them that, uh, you know, hitting the bars with whatever I could find. And when the, the, uh, the waters came, I said, I've, I've finished my sentence and I want to be removed, to be released now. And they said, no, chill, you will be released. Uh, 
and that didn't happen. Five o'clock, six o'clock in the evening, uh, somebody came and they, uh, they unlocked the single cell and I got out. And this time, uh, no um, tying of my hands or anything. I was just with one guy, a, an Africana guy. Uh, and we, we got into a car, they signed the, the release forms uh, out of uh, Petersburg prison, we drove south. That I could tell that we were driving south. And I asked this guy, hey, where are we going? And he said, no, nah, you will see. Um, and then we got to Port uh, Hitler's And this guy drove to a police station. I said, hey, why are you taking me to a police station? I'm supposed to be free now. I'm not supposed to be in your custody today. He said, no, nah, no, you chill. You will see. And uh, I got into the police station. Uh, they didn't put me in any solitary confinement. I was just sitting there in the, uh, at the reception of the police station. Uh, we waited and waited. Sometime uh, they took me to some room and uh, just as they were driving me to that other room, I could uh, hear a car uh, stopping uh, at high speed outside. And um, a, a, a guy came out in a suit and he had an envelope in his hand and he read the burning orders uh, to me, which said that from that day on what Jimmy Kruger was burning and restricting me to Makulering Township uh, and read all the, uh, uh, the provisions. Um, and when he had finished, they uh, asked me to sign. And uh, then a certain policeman, Marek Mafafu, uh, uh, asked me to go with him in his van. I was sitting in front for the first time, I was sitting next to him. Um, and as we drove, he asked me, they gave me 150 rands. Uh, they said this is to tide me up, uh, to uh, keep me alive. Um, and so with Mafafo, Mafafo asked me what I would like to get. So I said, no, I would like to buy fruit. Because you know, on Robben Island, we're not allowed to have fruit. For all those uh, years that we were there, no fruit. And so I like to, so I bought, uh, at a stop at a cafe. I bought uh, apples, oranges, peaches, bananas, everything, you know. Um, and some cold drink. And then he drove me to Mapuleri. Uh, I had asked him, where is Mapuleri? He said, no, no, you wait. We will, we will get there uh, very soon. And so we got there. He stopped in front of this uh, two-roomed house, um, uh, which was like a matchbox that had been sewn uh, the back part thrown out, but it was sealed at the back, so it had only one door. Um, and the guy had not, uh, there was no light, they, it was not electrified. I said, well, how am I supposed to exist in a place like this? Because it was already not dark now. Um, uh, should I, am I supposed to sit in the dark? Uh, so he quickly drove out to the shops and he brought uh, two candles or something. And uh, so he lit them. Uh, I was able to look inside the two, uh, two room house, which was painted black, uh, you know, and there were no curtains uh, to cover the windows. I said, no, but well, how am I supposed to, to sleep in a place like this where there are no, no curtains? He said, no, I can't do anything about that. I said, no, you must go and tell your bosses that uh, I've got to have curtains. Um, <clears throat> he said that tomorrow. So I had to get uh, newspapers and uh, put them uh, over the windows and then got out. Uh, I could see both sides of the house. There were uh, some people. So I, I had not uh, seen ordinary people, ordinary uh, families in the five years or so that I was uh, in prison. So I greeted them. Um, 
and, and they, uh, they had been told that a bandit was coming and that they should stay very far away from me, but particularly they must keep the children away from me uh, because they don't want the children to be contaminated by this uh, bandit who uh, will be unleashed or released in their uh, neighborhood. But in the next door neighbor uh, who I talked to, uh, Mr. Ledoire, uh, who turned out to be the, the nearest a friend uh, that, that we would have. Um, he asked me whether I had food and I didn't have any food. So uh, his wife uh, dished out and they asked me to come over. I said, but I can't come over because uh, every day from six in the evening to six in the morning, I'm supposed to be house arrested. I can't leave the yard. Um, and I can only leave the yard in the next morning. But even then, I could only be with one person at a time, as Machata has just explained. Uh, I couldn't leave the, the Mukerong uh, Magisterial District. I couldn't uh, work. I couldn't uh, write anything for publication um, and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, his wife dished and they put the, 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 the food uh, uh, next to the fence and I sit in my yard and the Mr. Ledwava sat in his yard and we shared a meal. Uh, in five years, it was the first time I shared a meal with uh, uh, somebody else. And as Matata indicated, I was a, a single then at 31 years old. I wasn't married, um, but I had a girlfriend in Johannesburg and uh, we communicated and uh, when she came, the Ledwaba family hosted her. And we could only sit because uh, we were not married, she was not allowed to come into my yard. Uh, and so they hosted her, she will uh, put up with them and bring me all the goodies, whatever they, she had. And um, we will sit and talk across the fence. Uh, until we got married, uh, Matata was uh, a witness uh, at my wedding. He had come earlier to do a story on the, this thing that uh, there, there is a, a guy who has been banned and, and, uh, and restricted to Makulering. Um, uh, the story I think was for the Post uh, newspaper. Uh, and so uh, quite a lot of people who have read that came to know and they would come around and, and, uh, and uh, just stare at this guy or just go past. Uh, but the, the, the neighbors on Saturdays and especially on Sundays when they had cooked, they would uh, dish for me as well, you know, because uh, I was uh, this army guy who was staying alone, single, he was not working, didn't have food, but I was afraid, at the same time, I was afraid of poisoning. I didn't know to what extent these people really wanted to help. Uh, but the Ledwawa family, really, I did eat their food um, uh, without any hesitation. But after I got married, uh, Matata was able to come in uh, uh, and celebrate the, the wedding uh, with us together with two others. So at our wedding, we had only three guests and Matata was one of them. Um, yeah, but we, we, we did try and beat the system. Uh, there was no political activity in Makulering at all when I got there. So that was something of a, a novelty, especially for young people. And uh, they started being drawn to me and we talked a lot of politics. Uh, we were going to, most of them were from Gojela High School. Uh, and they would come um, uh, and stand outside and we, I, I would talk to them outside the yard and I would talk to them. Uh, even if it was weekend, when I was um, uh, uh, house arrested from six o'clock uh, in the evening on Friday, until Monday morning at six o'clock. 
but they would come even if they they don't they don't uh, stand in the street they would go to the neighbors the children's neighbors uh, also got involved in politics they were very curious uh, they wanted to know what is going on politically why am i there and why uh, why is the system treating me like this the, if the system had thought that by doing this uh, it was um, alienating us from the people and that it was uh, uh, isolating us from our base, they were in fact spreading uh, political activity. And as a result of this, those young people from Gojela High School, all of them uh, became involved in the uh, uh, in Azapo. Uh, the only person who was uh, older was Mushitwana Mulala, that is Nkosi Mulala's older brother who was working for his brother who had a, a, a hotel in Makulere. And every now and then during the day, of course, amongst other places, I would go to the hotel to go and, uh, and phone, uh, to phone to Johannesburg and anywhere, everywhere else um, to be in contact with uh, people uh, or, or other political activists. And so my presence there uh, brought about political activity in Makwelerim. And many of those young um, uh, and others uh, became the seed uh, that eventually established a branch of Azapo there. And when uh, people like Kouvata, um, Semi uh, Kouvata, and the late Mosala uh, came and, and inaugurated the branch and political activity started. And then of course, uh, uh, my girlfriend then uh, asked that I should, uh, she thought I, was, I looked gaunt and, and sickly and so on, and said I should, insisted that I should go and see a doctor. And I asked around who was the doctor there and it turned out to be Tsetla Tsatla. I want to see him. And I had remembered him, you know, Tsatla had uh, such uh, uh, distinctive features, um, very light in, con in, in, complexion, in complexion, and the kind of uh, features that he had uh, were really unique. So I remembered him as a, an, an actor in a play during his days at uh, the University of Natal. They had come to the University of uh, Zululand where I, I had studied. So I remind, I asked whether he was the same guy. Yeah, he said he was the same guy and he was a black consciousness guy. And so we became friends uh, and comrades. And uh, in addition to he uh, looking after my health free of charge, um, he also offered me a job at his surgery. Uh, in order to take me away from the, uh, the, lo the, the, the loneliness uh, of uh, that two-roomed house. Um, and uh, so this became very easy then for the students and others in to come and see me there and we discuss politics uh, and so on. And he would also offer his uh, vehicles so that I could uh, on many occasions, I'll drive to Zanini to go and see Manpela, who was banned and restricted to Lenyanya Township um, at night. And the, the, the children of my neighbors uh, would come and lock up, you know, leave after dark, and I will light the candle so that it would appear as though there is somebody inside. And uh, say after nine o'clock or something, they would come and uh, uh, blow out the candle uh, and lock the door uh, so that when I come back in the small hours of the morning, um, uh, I'm able to get in. Uh, similarly, I would go to Soweto for meetings under those burning orders. Even with Mam Pila, we traveled together at one time to Soweto. Um, and at one time when my child was born, Comrade uh, Sasa gave me a, an ambulance to drive to uh, so I waited to go and see my firstborn and uh, told me how to operate it and uh, the lamp that uh, if I see a roadblock, 
I should just uh, put on that thing and uh, the, the, the light, you know, the, the red light, so that it will uh, 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 get these guys to believe that uh, an ambulance was uh, on a mission. Well, so that was what it was. Um, but we were uh, very uh, committed. We didn't mind this at all. We were uh, focusing on a, on a, on a course. Uh, lockdown, when it came, um, uh, was pop and place, you know? Um, but also it is like a friendly fire, you know? Uh, it was done in, in the interest of all of us. Um, it was uh, like benevolent uh, oppression. Uh, just that we couldn't now leave uh, our house unless it was necessary. I'm married now, I've got uh, children, um, and so we can be in touch. You can phone around. Uh, we can even do a Zoom with the children if they are in Gauteng and so on, to get in touch with their friends, unlike the situation under the burning orders where uh, you could not be in contact with anybody. You can, you can get newspapers here to read. You can watch um, um, uh, television. You listen to the radio and the news. Um, unlike what you had in, in solitary confinement where you couldn't do those things. Well, here too, you, can, uh, you were prohibited from having meetings. Um, but everybody understood why we couldn't have a meeting. We understood that it was for our own good, good of the, com of the, the country and our families and so on. We couldn't buy alcohol, uh, but who cares? You know, you couldn't buy uh, tobacco, but who cares? We could get in touch with uh, other people uh, and life um, uh, continued more or less normally. So emotionally, uh, the lockdown was not as taxing um, uh, as uh, the solitary confinement. It was not dangerous either. Nobody was attacking you. Nobody wanted to get uh, information out of you through torture. So this was really different. So with the lockdown, it was the entire country that was um, under section six. A relaxed one, uh, and so uh, it was pop and place for those of us who have gone through the real um, Section 6 and solitary confinement or burning orders and house arrests. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, this is this is really I'm processing all of this uh, experience and uh, this feedback and I'm like saying wow 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 um, this is this must have been very difficult to survive and yet you were at the time you know activists and um, people who had you know devoted your lives to struggle devoted you know, your lives to liberating people. And, and you knew what you were getting yourselves into um, because, you know, you had been trained in black consciousness, which really focused, uh, you know, much of its time at the time on, you know, psychological liberation. So in a sense, you had prepared yourselves uh, for, you know, anything that could happen to yourselves. Uh, I, I wonder now, when you look at what is happening in the country, you know, 26 years post, uh, you know, the first democratic election, is it the kind of sacrifice that you would say it was worth it? You know, having gone through all of the experiences that um, you endured during, uh, you know, that time of struggle, that time of confinement. And, and I'm also listening to the kind of things that you did to beat the system and looking at what people are doing now to beat the system of lockdown just to 
accumulate cigarettes, um, alcohol, and all of those kinds of things that they, they need for them to survive. You know, there are two, two experiences, you know, through engagement with people that, um, you know, have been subjected to this. One was a comrade who had spent many years um, in prison. And when he came out, one of the things that he said was that it was not possible for him to be in the same space with a group of people, more than uh, three or four or five people, because he just felt awkward in that space because you are so used to, you know, being confined in a space where there is one or two individuals. And now he has to, now that he has been, you know, been freed and uh, allowed to mingle with other people, he was afraid to be in the same space with a number of people in a party or in an environment where there's, a, you know, a lot of people. Uh, so it must have been very difficult to be integrated back into society and be able to live with people and do the normal things that uh, you know free people are are able to do that is that is just one experience of a person who you know had experienced the kind of experiences that you you endured and then during this present lockdown you have an individual who stays alone at, 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 at her property and, um, you know, spends much of her time at work with other people and enjoys her time and only goes home, uh, you know, because, you know, she's a young person, she only goes home to, to sleep or spends a li as little time as possible in that house. And now being subject, subjected to, you know, confinement of sorts, you know, so as to save her life and, and, and prevent her, you know, being infected by, by the coronavirus. And, and she had to be hospitalized because that was a new experience to her, uh, an experience that, um, you know, she was not ready for and ended up calling people and saying, well, I can't survive this environment. It, it got into her psychological makeup in a very big way. I don't know how you think what your comments are on, on these experiences. Comrade Matata. Um, the, the impact of um, banning orders and even detentions with solitary is, is living alone in a cell and all of that has a lasting uh, effect on people. So you develop a, a a liking to be alone in a way mm. um, because you you are comfortable with your thoughts and 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 everything else you yearn for company but mm. w w w when it is not there it's not as if it's a train match you 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 can live like that i see it i'm i'm like i was saying earlier i'm on a farm uh, it's just me and uh, three guys here who, who assist on the farm. My wife comes and goes, uh, <clears throat> but I'm fine. I haven't been to Jobex since February. Um, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> the, my ability to, to stay here in a very large way is also due to the fact that I was able to stay alone Mm. but not lonely yes mm. Mm. so it's, it's like, like i was saying earlier on it's it's quite important to actually um work it into your psyche mm. so that the the experience is positive and not negative mm. so the sister that you're talking about uh <clears throat> had dealt with uh her, her solitude as a loneliness <laughs> and <Indeed>. uh, <laughs> and she crashed uh, yeah yeah uh, that <laughs> I, I see you that, nodding mm. that, that uh, situation uh, affects people differently mm. and there are certain things that uh, do not leave you that, that continue to be part of your life, probably until the grave. Mm. Um, 
they, they, I've got a tendency not to close doors. You know, <laughs> simply because I think when you are in, in detention and in prison, people close, open and close doors for you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. so you think you are still in jail? <laughs> And, and, and I, I, I've been trying to be conscious and that I must, so because other people remonstrate with you, why don't you do mm. <laughs> So you're expecting somebody to be forcing you. <laughs> I must open the door and close it for me. But when uh, I go out, I'll open the door and then, uh, but some, for some reason, when I come in, I don't close the door. Mm. I, I, I forgot it, but I know that it is part of uh, the, uh, the some of the things that stay with you because. Mm. Of, but you are also uh, conscious, uh, you know, with this thing, for example, um, uh, my son who deals with this COVID thing, uh, set me and his mother down and said that because COVID nineteen loves people who are over 65, you people must stay home, you know? Mm, mm. So, so only when it's necessary and, you know, give us a, a <clears throat> lecture uh, on how we must behave, you mm. know? Uh, because these things, then, uh, and he himself does not come home anymore. And if he comes, he stands outside, you know? Mm. And so his sister not to, to visit us because it is, we are these people who are susceptible to the illness and so on. But because of um, awareness of what it means to be alone so much, we have, uh, uh, at my suggestion, that we should meet at least once a week, you know, mm. on all of us as a, as a family. As a family. You know, mm. yeah. Uh, on one another, check how we are doing psychologically, um, and so on. And um, as to whether this was worth it, that is uh, what we went through in the struggle for freedom, it was worth every effort, every pain that we suffered, uh, it, was, it was worthwhile. The thing is that we should be free to do whatever we like, to mess up this country or not to mess up, mm -hmm. not telling us what, it, what um, uh, is right and what is, is, is wrong, what we can do and what we cannot, what we can do and what we cannot do. We would like to do this ourselves, much mm -hmm. as we agree with uh, what our compatriots are doing, uh, but we do not regret the fact that uh, the country is now free and our people are free to mess up. <laughs> and so yeah. we should fight one another, but we should never regret the fact that we fought for freedom. Mm. Mm. And, and how easy was it to um, recommit yourselves to, you know, to struggle after, you know, getting out of jail, or you just saw it as a phase as, as part of struggle that, uh, you know, um, we, we, we can't, divorce this uh, being confined uh, to this one room or what is it, one, 1 1.2 square meter area. Um, so you saw it as part of struggle and therefore it was not a question of recommitting, but the question of continuing with where you, you left off, uh, you know, we struggle. Because I mean, some of you, uh, whilst you were confined in those, um, you know, houses through burning order, you, you continued to break the law and uh, you know, continued with the program of, of liberation. Um, so how easy was it, or was it just a question of determination that uh, you know, this, we see it as a detour in the journey towards uh, you know, liberation of our people, or did you see it as um, you know, the pain um, you know, that should not be endured by people? Um, <clears throat> for me, uh, the my my whole approach was that South Africa for us as black people was just one large prison. Mm. 
uh, and the difference between me when I was in Sishiko under a burning mod was the length of chain that I carried. It was shorter than other people who could walk around even over weekends. Mm. And when I was taken even out of that burning order into a cell, the, for me, it was just the shortening of the chain. Mm. The struggle mm. was always about removing the chain. So uh, when you come out, the chain is still there. The struggle to remove that chain had to go on. There was no, no, no need to even have some kind of internal debate in within yourself about so manje gay no there wasn't anything like that mm, mm. no that's that's uh, that's good to hear because you know what we see now with this uh, coronavirus lockdown is um you know people one 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 individual was saying to me the other day that um he was forced by his you know it's, it, there's a difference between you as patriots who committed yourselves to struggle and people being forced into uh you know house co house confinement uh, because of the virus that they don't even mm -hmm. understand uh, because if you go to some of the areas in the townships um you know they don't even understand this thing and and they feel you know confined in the space and they can't even move because of you know the size of the houses in the communities where they live um it, it really affected uh, you know them to a point where they had to find other things to do one guy was saying to me that he was asked by his wife to transcribe the bible you know and <laughs> Uh, look at you know he's he's never read the Bible because he doesn't care about going to church, but he had nothing to do, and and for him to survive, he had to you know transcribe the Bible for 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 his wife, you know, just to kill time and just to make sure that he doesn't break down psychologically. Um, so it, you know it is much easier for for you, Comrade Bataru, yes, in your in your farm, and uh, Daremangena understands, uh, you know, the the situation in which we are. And, and yet, if you go to our communities in the townships, a lot of our people do not understand why we have to be subjected to this lockdown. And it was very, very tough for a lot of people to, to have been able to survive uh, this far. So the experience of many of our people, more for so when they don't understand and when they are not committed to the cause uh, becomes a different world game to get all together. And which is why, you see um, a lot of negative action of people breaking this thing because um, you know it's not about health of the people or the liberation of the people, but it's about I need I need cigarettes, I need alcohol, I can't survive this thing. So 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 it's, it's different experiences for our people uh, than um, what you what you see and what you are saying uh, right now. I don't know what you what your views are uh, with regard to what we see out there. Well, you, you know, uh, people are not the same. Mm. Uh, uh, even under, say, uh, detention, people took it differently. There are people who were able to endure solitary confinement better than others. Mm. And uh, on Robben Island, for example, one of our biggest weapons that we used against the system when we were unhappy, when we were aggrieved by something, was to go on hunger strike. Mm. There are people who just after just one day, they can't take it. You know, one day of not eating, they can take mm. it. And mm. there are people who can take it, say, three, four days. After four days, they can't take it anymore. But there are people who are like Bobby Sam, who uh, uh, can take it until death. So th there, there is a, a people react differently to different situations. Um, but one of the most important things, especially with uh, the kind of lockdown that we have, which is, uh, well, it, it's, it's not that mm. bad, is to find something to do, something mm. to kill the time. Uh, for example, one of the things that I decided to do was to write more. So mm. I wrote a manuscript during this uh, lockdown period. Uh, it, it brings about a lot more discipline mm. 
I had nothing to do with my father and bones and, and stuff like that to, to deal with. So he devoted his uh, energies and time and he could go out on walks on the farm. You can't go out on, far, on walks uh, in the suburb here under lockdown level five because that was not allowed. So mm. you can go to your yard, then go back to the desk and write something. So mm. other people were watching TV more than ever before or gymming in their own yards and so on. But you've got to try and find something, not dwell on the negative side of the lockdown. Mm. Um, especially if you know that it is uh, supposed to be uh, something we do for our own benefit, for our own good, and for the good of the nation. Mm. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's something that um, uh, is easy to enjoy, especially, as I said, you know, there, are, there, are, there are newspapers, there is television, there is radio, there are uh, family members. So you ought to be able to survive this better than uh, mm. you would to. In any case, they did it uh, something like a few months at a time. Whereas confinement or banning orders were for five years, not three months. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> five years is a very long time. I can't believe that an hour is already gone. Uh, you know, I'll, you know, I'm really enjoying the conversation, but uh, we'll have to end it at some point. Um, I don't know what uh, Kumbhi Matata you want to say as as a closing comment in terms of uh, you know. The importance of patriotism, uh, because you know all of this um, you went through uh, because you were patriots, and uh, we are in this lockdown because you know we need to be patriotic to to ourselves and to our nation, and make sure that we continue to live as as a society, and uh, you know present, uh, prevent uh, you know people from you know the ills of the pandemic. And a lot of us have um, looked up to to your good selves as an example of you know commitment to to resolve commitment to our struggle and uh, have benefited a lot from you know the knowledge and the experience that you've shared over the years um, and, and it's always great um, you know to to listen to your experiences and uh, what you went through and any any last um, comments from your side um no i would say that um the COVID is a, it's, it's, it's a, a problem today. Um, we have the whole country uh, to build mm. and even to rescue before we even build it. So the commitment to doing right Mm. has to be the guiding force at all times. We must survive COVID in order for us to rescue the country and rebuild it. Mm. Mm. If you're going to go reckless uh, and die because of something that you could have avoided, uh, that's like treason because you are now robbing the struggle to rescue the country and rebuild it. Mm. Mm. Okay. We seem to have um, uh, lost connectivity there. Comrade Matata. Okay, we we have we have lost him. Um, you know, he's he's in a farm, <laughs> and you should expect. Those kind of uh, tech problems. Uh, Comrade Mangana, any closing comments from your side? No, I think uh, uh, COVID uh, is, is, is a very serious matter uh, that affects uh, the lives of all our citizens. And uh, in addition to we doing all we can to survive so that as we can uh, rebuild this country, we need to think of uh, our compatriots. Whatever we mm -hmm. do, think of the next person that you've got to protect your family, protect your friends, uh, protect uh, your uh, compatriots, uh, so that we can all 
uh, conquer, survive this pandemic uh, so that our, our nation can go forward. Um, and we, none of us um, should allow himself or herself to be selfish, to think about himself or herself only, but to think about um, the entire country, that we are each other's brother, each other's sister's keeper, and mm. therefore behave in a manner um, that assists us in defeating this health pandemic. Mm. Uh, thank you very much to Comrade uh, Musibudu Mangena and uh, Comrade uh, Matata Tzedu for agreeing to spend the afternoon with us. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you again uh, next Saturday when we um, spend the afternoon with uh, Comrade Ibrahim Fakir. And um, uh, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Let's connect again next weekend. Uh, thank you and bye-bye uh, everybody.